Okay, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, or good morning, um, depending on which part of the world you are. Um, so this presentation is to give you a little bit of information about um, some of the programs that we run at the School of Property Construction and Project Management. I've also got with me one of our uh, students from the master's program, Srivats Parayal, and um, he will be talking a little bit later on his experiences as a student at RMIT. So to commence with, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is uh, Usha Ayavaniga, and I'm Deputy Head International at the School of Property, Construction, and Project Management. Um, what I'm going to talk to you uh, about a little bit today is about sustainability and why do we need to think about sustainability issues in the built environment. A little bit about myself first. Um, I am originally from India. I have been in Australia for almost 30 years. Uh, I did uh, my master's um, in uh, architecture from the University of British Columbia in Canada after doing a bachelor's degree from the University of, it used to be then called the University of Bombay, it's now University of Mumbai. Um, and I did my uh, PhD at the University of Melbourne. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about sustainability and why this is important in the built environment. The built environment is a part of our day-to-day -day activity. Um, food, shelter, and clothing are essential that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you think about the built environment, you don't just think about where you live or where you work. You also need to start thinking about where you get your food um, and your clothing, as well as the products that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. The world is constantly changing around us. Um, about 100 years ago or 150 years ago, it was very common to have a horse and a cart, and therefore people were restricted with what they did. But come the Industrial Revolution, and you'll see this, um, the first Ford car um, that was manufactured in Detroit in, in the picture that is Mark 6 on the slide, that has changed the way we build buildings, the way we build our city. Um, so 7 and 8, um, 7 depicting roads and road transportation, and eight being one of the different forms of transportation that we use today. So the current built environment is continuously changing. Um, slide, num slide number three um, has got a picture number nine um, on the top, which talks about, which really shows, I think, um, what the industrial age was like. Um, this picture is again of a city in New York um, where uh, a lot of factories were, were built and in those days we did not have as much transportation as we do now. So the, ma the major means of transport when rails came in was of course through the railroad and by sea. But now the picture on the tin, um, which is of Singapore, a lovely picture of Singapore, um, shows a high activity that takes place on a daily basis. So when we think about the built environment, what are some of the images that go through your mind? Um, of course, uh, you live in a home or you live in a flat. Uh, you may be uh, going to university. You may be going to a place of work. You may be going out with friends. And the important thing is that we spend quite a lot of our time indoors. And that is why the quality of our environment becomes very, very important. There is a very tenuous link between the quality of our indoor environment and, and the way people live within the indoor environment. And sometimes, um, and, and as this shows, this is an OECD report from 2002, um, sometimes the, the air quality in the built environment might actually be even worse than that of the outdoor environment. And this is particularly the case when you're looking at cities such as in the Philippines, or in India, or in China, or in Indonesia, where there are not as many controls for pollution and, and um, if there is no ventilation of spaces within the indoor environment, then some of these pollutants can actually stay inside for days or for weeks to come. And that in turn impacts on health, 
and, uh, and the uh, conditions within which people are working. Let us now look at some of um, the drivers from an international perspective that is putting sustainability, climate change, resilience, adaptation onto the uh, world stage or to the world map. Um, a lot of work around sustainability, even though it started in the 70s and 80s, recent attention has only been um, has have been highlighted or this has been a spotlight over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, two recent events that I want to highlight. One is the development of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. So we had the Millennium Development Goals that were set up in 2000. And for whatever reason, which I won't go, which I won't go into now, um, these uh, these Millennium Development Goals didn't actually get a lot of traction. And part of the reason why the traction um, did not happen was because it was very skewed uh, towards the inputs that were provided by developed countries. Um, and so it is really important to hear the voices from developing countries such as India and China who, are, who have got the highest um, population in the world, um, and also going through a rapid phase of urbanization. Um, so just moving along uh, in terms of these international drivers, I want to focus a little bit on the sustainable development goals. Um, why are these goals important? These goals are important because from a global perspective, um, the sustainable development goals became the means uh, and the method by which we can start putting a yardstick around our own processes of development. So what are these 17 goals? Um, no poverty, um, no hunger, um, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, uh, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduce inequality, sustainable city and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, so thinking not just about what happens above ground, but also what happens below ground and, and, and on the seas, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions and partnership for the world. Now, as you can see, these 17 goals are um, quite um, focused not just on one aspect, but also bringing, it's a framework that brings in a range of different issues. So this has actually been part of the reason why these sustainable development goals are getting a lot more traction, because it doesn't provide just the one means, but it provides a framework which is fair and equitable for both the developed countries as well as the developing countries. And what is really interesting, if you look at it from a built environment, is that it touches on a number of different areas, health and well-being, education, water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, cities, communities, consumption and production, climate action and partnership. So it is not possible for us or any one country or any one set of population across the world to be focusing on only one of these 17 goals. We have to work in partnership between developed and developing countries, between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, and everybody needs to work together to realize these sustainable development goals. In 2015, as part of this Rio Plus 20, um, a new framework was launched called the 10-year framework. And under the 10-year framework, there were six programs. Um, the six programs are sustainable tourism, sustainable lifestyles and education, sustainable consumer information, sustainable public procurement, sustainable buildings and construction, and sustainable food systems. So as you can see, these six programs are linked with some of the frameworks around which the 17 goals of the Sustainable Development Goals are set. Under the uh, Sustainable Buildings and Construction Program, you can see who are some of the players, and this is worldwide. So there are, there are um, industry players, there, there are governments, there are NGOs, um, as well as RMIT University. 
in addition to this, we work with a range of people globally. So we work with people um, across um, the UN. We work with um, uh, peak industry bodies such as the World Green Building Council. Uh, we work with the Ministry of, of Environment, based in Finland. Um, we also work across um, a range of people, um, and you can see this um, named as MAC, the Multi-Stakeholder Environment Committee, which includes people from 23 different economies. Um, and these are some of um, our partners um, in the Sustainable Buildings and Construction Program. We have governments from Argentina, France, Malaysia, Singapore, and South Africa. Business organizations such as CANSCA, uh, which is well known throughout Europe and in, as well as in North America. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Range of people from academia. Um, international government organizations such as um, UN Habitat and UNOPS, um, as well as a range of different NGOs. These are the themes that make up the SBC program. Um, we, we're looking uh, across the board um, at uh, social and economic issues, across poverty, water, housing, resources, um, as well as innovation. Let me now talk a little bit about sustainability. So with this framework and this backdrop of what is happening in a global context, I'm hoping that you're able to get a better context around the issues of sustainability in the built environment. So I'm going to go through some very um, quick definitions around sustainability. What does it really mean? And what might it mean to you? And how do you put sustainability into practice? Um, a couple of examples to start with. This is a picture um, that shows what is left behind when you have an open cut coal mine. So this is a picture of an open cut coal mine in Utah in the US. To deliver one kilogram of gold, you need to use about 540 tons of coal. And this is what is left behind. So often the process of consumption, the process of production, leaves behind um, quite damaging uh, legacy back onto the earth and back onto the environment, which is going to take a number of years, thousands of years perhaps even, to heal. And some consequences are really um, unknown or un, um, uh, un, um, unknown at the start, but also very difficult to predict, um, so often unpredictable. Um, and here is another example of using um, uh, water for cotton production. Um, this is a, this is an example um, of the Aral Sea um, in the late 1990s, where there was a diversion of water for cotton, cotton production, and this is what is left behind. So here again is an example of when water sources are being diverted, uh, either for damming or for the purposes of agriculture, downstream can have some very serious impacts, um, and of course uh, uh, added to that would be, well, where, where does the person downstream or where does the community or villages that are living downstream have access to water for the day? So the process of production and consumption in the built environment does leave an impact. So buildings typically consume about 30 to 50 percent of available raw materials. They account for about 25 to 40 percent of final energy consumption and generate about 40 percent of waste to landfill and old sea water. Um, and below this, I have given you further details on different types of <clears throat> materials and the impact that it might have. Now, put this into context with what is happening in countries like China and India, where there's massive um, growth in uh, infrastructure, in city building, and just imagine what impact this is going to have on the planet in the years to come. Um, here is an example from Australia. On the left-hand side is a pie chart that shows what are the what are the carbon dioxide equivalents of greenhouse gas emissions from um, the residential sector. And on the right-hand side, this is focusing purely on working. I'm not going to dwell further, but just to highlight that in both these pie charts, um, household water use or, or, or the way people use um, their houses, the way people use water can actually have quite a large impact um, in terms of energy and water use. Things can be learned by taking an evolutionary approach or an evolutionary framework for sustainability. 
So um, the current understanding, which is the, uh, the framework which is helping us drive things like the sustainable development goals, is along these, these ideas that sustainability is a process and therefore we need to innovate. And that's one of the sustainable development goals. We need to um, ensure that there's equity across different parts of the planet. Um, there is no way to be responsible in terms of our production and consumption. Um, we need to think about um, something that's happening now, but also bearing in mind what is going to be happening in the future. So essentially, we need to learn from the past, and we need to forge ahead, forge ahead um, bearing in mind that these lessons from the past are going to help us uh, develop and move ahead um, towards um, sustainability. And we, and we work together in a partnership approach. So you may have heard about the triple bottom line, where the sweet spot for sustainability is, is the environmental, the economic and the social. And unfortunately, what has happened is when we started um, uh, going going on the, on the direction of sustainability, we started very much with the environmental and the economic approach because, of course, financial, financial considerations are very important considerations for what we tend to do. Um, the social side of sustainability has largely been left behind. And there are lots of authors that argue that even the cultural side of sustainability needs to be considered. Um, so this um, triple bottom line, or as I call the three-legged stool, is currently not an even evenly balanced tool. It's skewed towards environmental and economic, but hopefully the sustainable development goal will put social sustainability and cultural sustainability as front and center of um, this triple bottom uh, line approach to sustainability. I'm going to also very quickly, because um, I realize that we're already half an hour into the, uh, into the presentation, um, I also want to very quickly touch on some other uh, terms that are being used, and you've probably been hearing about these either through the media or um, uh, through your own uh, studies. The terms that are currently being used, and particularly if you are in, in um, the Asia Pacific region, um, or in the European region, you would hear about terms of zero or net zero and zero positive. Um, you would hear about um, nearly net zero. So these are all issues um, that are dealing with um, how can we try and uh, ensure that what we take in terms of the energy use is actually positive at the end of the day. Um, so when we uh, operate buildings, we rely on sources of energy that come in usually from our utility provider. Um, but there are countries and there are increasingly policies being, uh, uh, being directed towards ensuring that people are becoming more savvy in terms of using renewables. So it's, for example, it's not unusual, um, and this has been an issue in Australia where the federal government has supported policies around putting solar panels Moves, and they have given subsidies uh, for homeowners to put solar panels on their roof. As a result of these sort of approaches, um, there are opportunities where, uh, when the, when even when somebody is not at home during the day, the solar solar panels, are, particularly when there's sunshine, the solar panels are producing energy, which can then go back into the grid. Um, some uh, developments are now taking place, particularly around smart cities in India, around zero energy developments in China, where um, large developments are actually having access to, to renewable energy. Sometimes it is solar. Sometimes it may be other means such as geothermal. Sometimes it may be wind, um, where uh, these sources of energy are actually developing uh, and implementing uh, and ensuring that there's enough energy for, for um, use uh, during the daytime. Some of these developments have batteries associated with it, so you can also store the energy and you can use it at night time. And this is where some of the positive side of zero energy and positive development are coming into the picture. There's also the issue of cost, of course, um, and uh, there is, uh, uh, along with these terms of 
you know, energy or you know, positive. There's also the issue of cost. Um, and and of course, no utility provider is going to uh, take uh, uh, energy from you and pay you more money than they're sending it back. So there are some issues that are that are being debated, particularly in Australia, around what are called those payment habits. So um, with this as a sort of a background um, and this knowledge about sustainability being something that we're continuously striving to achieve. Um, do you think, and I, I'm not going to, to ask people, but I want you to think about it. Do you think it is possible for you to achieve 100% sustainability at any one given point in time? And if you think it is possible, think about why that might be the case. And if it's not possible, why not? And what are your considerations? Um, you know, something for you to think about and perhaps discuss with your friends and your colleagues or, or even your family members. Um, Here's an example of where um, at, a, at, an, um, at a design show in 2006, um, prior to the Nicholas Stern report, uh, people were asked whether 100% sustainability was possible. 53% said yes, and 47% said no. And interestingly enough, when people who said yes were queried further, they all had different perceptions of what it means. Um, and, and here again are why we've had a lot of um, discussions and debates um, and agreements that are still not being um, uh, adhered to it in spite of ratifications and endorsements around sustainability. Um, so even though people might think um, that it is sustainable, um, you, you won't actually, uh, unless and until you go back and measure it, you're not actually going to get um, an, uh, a feedback evaluation of uh, what really has been possible. Um, and this sort of, I think, summarizes the, the, um, the issues around sustainability, particularly from a design perspective. It's one of the most complex and confusing uh, subjects that a designer has to tackle. But does this mean that you as an individual or a citizen of a planet, does it mean that you don't do anything and just sit and wait for people to make decisions for you? I'll leave that to you. But when you do think about changing your light bulb at home, think about what globe you're going to be using. Here in Australia, we have actually phased out um, the, the old incandescents, um, and we only use either LEDs, which are still reasonably expensive. Um, halogens are gone from the market, and we use um, very uh, highly energy efficient uh, globes. Um, during the period of drought, we were very, very careful uh, particularly in Victoria, we had something called Target 155, where every household, um, every person in every household shouldn't be using more than 155 litres of water a day. Um, and we were very careful in how we used water for the house, um, whether it was for bathing, um, for drinking or cooking. Um, and we used a lot of um, uh, our water for, uh, for laundry purposes as well. And there was a um, high uh, increase and high rate of people that started installing their water to start being useful um, in your home. Um, so it's really up to you um, to decide what you think um, uh, you think is, is appropriate from your perspective. We have a lot of debates and discussions um, around transportation as well, um, particularly in Australia. We tend to have uh, now uh, it's not uncommon to have homes with with Average home of about 2.3, uh, but you might have um, the average average numbers of car of three. So um, it's certainly uh, here in Australia, we tend not to use a lot of public transport. We tend to still rely on the car as a means of getting a message from our school. Um, Jay um, said it very well um, in his book, where <clears throat> where he says. That if every Australian household switched to renewable energy and stopped driving their cars tomorrow, the total household emissions would decline by more than 10%. Um, and of course, this is theoretical, this is not realistic. And even if Australia, the 24 million population of Australia, did this, what about what's happening with the masses in Europe or in North America? Um, so, uh, given that we just have a minute or so left, 
um, I want you to start thinking about uh, how can you uh, focus on some of the skills that you might be able to develop. And of course, RMIT is one organization that can help you get there. Um, and um, if you're thinking of uh, working in the built environment space, just bear in mind that uh, we are classified as above world standard in the built environment sphere, which includes engineering, architecture, and so on. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, so there's a question um, that um, Andres has asked, um, which, which is um, rich countries, only rich countries can afford to go sustainable. And that's not really true because if you think about um, uh, villages in in um, in Asia or in Africa, uh, or even if you go back to the pre-industrial age, we lived within um, what we could afford, um, afford being in quotes, in terms of resources that we could get from within a local environment. Um, and of course, things have changed so much now. Um, so when you consider what we were like um, thousands of years ago, and um, what the future is going to hold in terms of the food we eat, um, the clothes we buy, um, the gadgets that we have, or the electronic gadgets that we have. Um, it is actually quite remarkable um, in terms of uh, how far along we have come. But, but one of the things that I want to highlight is that uh, perhaps compared to the um, uh, IT industry, the built environment industry is not as fast paced in terms of change. So it's, it's a relative dinosaur in terms of making changes. But I'm hoping that um, uh, what the, when you get a chance, please have a look at the um, Hyperloop video. And that might change things quite drastically. Um, so things, aren't, things are basically not going to remain what they are. Um, it's going to change a lot in the future. Um, I've also got a question from Moaz. Uh, who is asking me, uh, what does it mean to live within the means, within the resources they have? Does it mean that communities or nations are not supposed to trade? Not at all. In fact, um, it is not possible for one country or one, or one community um, to geographically uh, be untouched by sustainability. So what, I'm, what I mean when I say that is that um, uh, the, uh, for example, if you look at emissions, um, that is global. It doesn't have any uh, geographic, geographical boundaries. And so um, if you take something from the ocean, everybody is affected. If you spew something into the atmosphere, everybody is affected. And so that is why we need to trade and we need to, part we need to partner, and we need to collaborate, and we need to make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes and we're learning um, to respect uh, people for what they have uh, and for the people that don't have. I hope that answers the question. Perhaps while you're typing your question, I can bring uh, Srivats on board. Um, so Srivats is um, one of our students in the Master of Project Management program at the School of Property Construction and Project Management. Um, and I will hand you over to Srivats. Hi, everyone. Um... Yeah, uh, thanks for that uh, wonderful presentation, Usha. I mean, uh, you know, it was a real wonderful. Uh, I, I understand that there's a lot of questions that is popping in. Even uh, she answered a question to my, uh, because she actually did tell about 540 tons of earth being wasted when gold is removed out. Now I understand why gold is so costly. <laughs> so let me speak about myself. Uh, yeah, I'm. I've completed like two semesters in RMIT and uh, I'm from India. It's been about eight months and uh, it's about uh, three three more months for my next semester to kick in. I'm doing my master's in project management with a specialization in IT. And uh, what I've practically experienced over here, over here is just not, uh, just not the way theory is, just how Usha told, Yes, it is combined with a practical experience because the teachers who do teach us, they are just not professionals or they're just not, uh, they're just not academics in order to be very specific, but they are the ones who really have an industrial experience. So 
they know a practical what things happen and you know they kind of can combine the theory with the practice that's that's what you actually realize when you study in rmit and uh, to start with usha did tell about uh, the weather in rmit it's it's windy it's rainy it's sunny similarly is the culture over here in rmit you know you find people from china you find people from india you find people from indonesia it's a cross culture that is actually seen in melbourne similar culture is actually seen in rmit so in your class when you do get a study when you know when you do projects in groups you split into different groups where you have aussies you have people from new zealand you have people from your own you know you have people from your own country you have people from china you have so the cross culture growth and the learnings that you receive from for example from the way i never knew how australia is or how people in australia think or i never knew how people in indonesia think or you know what is their take on things all that happened because you know the way we interacted the way rmit structures it in having it multicultural so that really has helped and uh, yeah another thing uh, it really helped me to understand the, the sustainable aspect because uh, another important aspect you know when you think of studying in australia or any other place for example is how about the part time opportunities do you get to work or something like that this presentation was very helpful because i actually work as a solar consultant uh, you know so it was very easy for me to understand okay this is the positive aspect of sustainability and yes sustainability has really helped me to get a part time job so uh, in terms of part time job uh, many uh, many students would have many concerns would we be getting a part time job would we be getting something related to the same industry and uh, how is life in melbourne are uh, is it very student friendly or is it only studies that happens in rmit a range of different things ha happen in rmit among the extracurricular activities that do happen about the sports that do happen and uh, the way they recognize the multiculture in rmit uh, you know people of different nations the people of different nations once in a year or maybe like twice in a year we do have a seminar and also different cultures they do show their dance their, their songs and things like that so it is wonderful space for everyone to interact with what i feel and uh, what i've actually felt in rmit i do not know if you have any other queries in regards to how life in rmit is or anything in regards to sustainability um while you while you are pondering some of um shivats's um experience at rmit um uh, there are i think um three questions that um have resulted from uh, the uh, presentation that i made um yasha says i think the amount of sustainability in any country depends on various criteria and also um and also uh, every country is just good because it's, re it's related to the indigenous resources i'm not quite sure um what the question here is but i think yes i mean um we all have to live within our means and i think um people do that from an economic perspective um so you know you buy a car that you can afford or pair of shoes that you can afford uh but we don't think about the environment um in that in that same way and so um when we started thinking about sustainability we looked at it purely from an environmental perspective and there's nothing wrong with that um and then of course it costs to do things right so we started thinking about it from an economic perspective but what we didn't do was we didn't think about equity we didn't think about our cultures and our traditions um and and the way we we behave on a day to day basis and that is why i say the three legged stool is is actually a, a very unbalanced stool um and and so a, a lot of the work is now being done around bringing in good quality of life so just because you have money you have uh, things around you you uh, might have a very high um, footprint from your consumption perspective doesn't necessarily give you um, a better quality of life so that is very very important um another question um, that patrice has raised 
phase, um, does it mean that Africa and African countries can possibly achieve or approach 100% sustainability um, as compared to the rest of the world? Um, I'm not saying that uh, you need to not develop, that you, need, you, you should not have uh, growth and development as a part of sustainability. What I am saying, though, is that if we think long term, if we think about uh, the fact that we have only one planet um, to live in, and most likely, despite what has been going on in terms of research uh, of, you know, of discovering other planets or living on Mars, um, the reality, though, is that um, in the next uh, you know, uh, short to medium term, and here I'm saying in terms of hundreds of years, the fact is going to remain that we're going to live with what we've got. And so we need to think about long term. And it's really up to different countries and different people to decide what they believe is that benchmark of sustainability for them. So I hope that answers um, that question, uh, Patrice. Moaz has asked, how do we combine construction with sustainable built environment? Um, and, and how does this relate to green points like cement exporting and importing countries? Um, what I haven't touched in this presentation are different measures of sustainability in the built environment. So we haven't um, covered in this presentation things like rating tools, uh, rating tools at the building level, rating tools for products, um, or, or otherwise known as eco-label. We haven't talked about rating tools at the community level. We haven't talked about smart cities. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are different uh, measures and nobody is agreeing uh, on what these common measures are or what these common measures ought to be. So we are very much at a very um, early stage of trying to understand what is it that we can use to measure, um, what is it that we can set as targets. And one of the biggest criticisms with these measures of sustainability is that everybody looks at it from a design perspective, but nobody actually, um, after, after the building or, or the infrastructure has been completed, nobody actually goes back and evaluates. So those feedback loops are often not complete. Um, so I hope that answers that question. And the final one we have um, is from Yasha, who says, I believe in sustainability as a comprehensive approach which is helpful to increase, for instance, the quality of life. But first, we should think that in what scale we want that to go forward. Absolutely, and I agree with you. And that is why you cannot have, you know, the billions of people in this world all wanting to have the same approach. Um, and that is why it has to be uh, for uh, debated and discussed at a country level, at the city level, um, at a regional level. Um, at a local level, um, because we are all masters of our own destiny, and we 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 um, eat what we want on a day-to-day -day basis. We live how we like on a day-to-day -day basis. We buy what we want on a day-to-day -day basis. But I hope that this has given you something something to think about when you next eat some food. Um, hopefully, you'll wonder where this food has come from. Um, uh, when you um, uh, getting water, I hope try not to drink bottled water uh, if at all possible because there's a lot of um, um, uh, transportation um, and, and um, plastic and everything else that goes into the production of, of bottled water um, and there are lots of things that you can see on YouTube videos um, around these sorts of things. Um, Paul is saying wonder if 100% sustainability is not easy when man stops being selfish. Well, I think that's a decision that people have to make at the world. Um, are there any questions for Srivats? Um, another question uh, that has come up is from Moaz. Uh, what's going to be the outcome of COP2015, especially since President-elect is debating on a rethink of the US participation? Sorry, it is a bit political, but still lies in our agenda and sphere. Absolutely right. Um, um, quite frankly, I'm a bit worried uh, because we don't really know um, uh, where and how President Trump, elect President-elect Trump, 
um, is going to uh, lead America um, and, uh, uh, and often the rest of the world is looking to America for leadership. Um, but um, yeah, time will tell. Time will tell. Um, so we, we're coming to the end. It's, it's just a few minutes past nine. Um, but I hope um, you've had uh, a good experience about some of the things that we think about. We are a university that is not just thinking, but acting. We walk the talk. Um, we have a great student population. Um, and I hope she was to give you an insight into that student population. Um, and if you have any questions about studying at RMIT, um, uh, uh, Ryan, who is our moderator today, will place um, a link um, that you can use to um, get in touch with us. So I hope this has been um, a good um, uh, insight into uh, what it is that uh, we do at RMIT. And if there are any questions, um, yes, so Ryan has put the information. Um, you can get in touch with ISU at RMIT. So thank you, everyone. Um, I hope uh, this has been an interesting uh, hour for you. Um, and um, wherever you are and whatever you do, I hope you think about sustainability with your next food or drink or discussion. Thank you all very much.